from the standpoint of the hominid lineage that they were, they were, they were talking about. So, uh, and then what Rick did is convert those numbers into, uh, in, into uh, equivalent numbers for the whale uh, transition given what we know about generation times and mutation rates and so forth for those animals. Um, so we have a, we have a, we have a, big, a, a big numbers problem. But the problem doesn't stop, uh, stop there. We have a second problem, which we call the problem of combinatorials, or the, sometimes the problem of combinatorial and specificity. If you think back to 1953 and the discovery of the structure of the DNA molecule, and the recognition soon thereafter that DNA encodes information in the form of a four-character alphabetic code, or four-character chemical code, uh, that had a profound effect on thinking in evolutionary biology. And most, it, uh, it affected thinking in neo-Darwinian theory in that people postulated that changes in the arrangement of those chemical letters in the, in the DNA molecule could be the source of variation. And we call those changes now mutations. But neo-Darwinism made an assumption that was conceded in Rick's analysis that may not actually be true. And in fact, the talk we're going to see to, uh, here next is going to show that this assumption is false. And so therefore, the problem that Dr. Sternberg has just illumined is actually more severe than, than even he has indicated. And the assumption that neo-Darwinism made was that mutations can generate new genetic information and new traits rather readily. If you change the, the sequence of the genes, the, the sequence of bases in the genes, you can generate new proteins rather readily. Dr. Axe is now going to look at whether or not that's really true. Um, here's a, a nice picture of the DNA molecule, and here's a way to, to, to kind of put this in context. If we begin to think about the, the informational nature of, 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 of biology, and that DNA encodes information in the form of a four-character code, and we begin to then think about other codes and languages that we know of that use similar ways of conveying information, a question arises. If you begin, here's the question, if you begin to degrade, the, or ch rather, if you begin to change the characters in a message that has a, is of a digital, digital or alphabetic nature, you begin to change them at random, are you more likely to enhance the message or to degrade it? Now, intuitively, especially when we think of English code, English, English text, or computer code, we want to say, it seems more likely you're degraded. Uh, so, time and time, wait for no man, you start changing the letters around, and pretty soon you're going to efface the information that was there originally. You might get lucky, get one, one letter to change, but keep doing it for very long, you're going to efface the original message. Now, the question is, is that same, uh, well, first of all, why is that? Well, the reason for that turns out to be what we call the combinatorial problem. There are so many different, if you have a, say, 20-letter sequence, there are so many different ways of arranging 20 characters in, say, English, that the, nu the number of functional sequences of 20 letters long is a tiny, tiny fraction of the total number of ways of combining the 26 letters in the English alphabet of a, in a 20-letter sequence. So that the, the space of functional sequences is tiny compared to the number of possible combinations of letters that there are. Now, early on, biologists thinking about, or mathematicians thinking about the, the neo-Darwinian mechanism began to wonder if this same thing wasn't true of the information encoded in DNA. The arrangements of bases in DNA and the corresponding arrangement of amino acids and proteins. Because if it is the case that there are very few functional sequences in comparison to all the combinations of possible arrangements that are out there, then if you think about a blind mutational search, finding those new functional sequences, you've got real problems. So a crucial question became one that was in fact posed by Doug Axe in his laboratory when he was working in Cambridge. And the question is, how rare or common are functional proteins in relation to all the possible combinations, corresponding co combinations of amino acids? Same question, you could ask the same question about functional genes in relation to all the possible combinations of, of nucleotide bases. 
Are they very rare or are they relatively common? If the functional sequences are common, then neo-Darwinism's got a shot. It can blindly stumble from one little island of function to the next. But if they're rare or prohibitively rare, then the mechanism is not going to get it done and it's going to be insufficient to create even new genes or proteins or, as Dr. Axe has tested it, even a single new protein fold. Now just one more little illustration and I'll get him up here to talk about some of the cutting edge aspects of this debate or this, this, this research. Um, how many combinations are it possible to get four uh, dial walk? Ten on each dot, ten, ten, ten characters on each dial. So you might be tempted to say ten plus ten plus ten, but it doesn't work that way, does it? It's ten times ten, ten times ten times ten. So on a four dial walk, you've got ten thousand combinations. All right. Now on, I had this art, the artist mock this up. I've never seen a lock like this, but this would really. <laughs> <sound> <laughs> Because if you've got a 10 dial lock, you don't just have a few more. Uh, you've got 10 times 10, you got 10 to the 10th possibilities. Okay? And that's, that's, uh, that's the problem. So if you've got your, your thief out there on the quad trying to pick a lock like that, and there's only one functional combination in relation to 10 to the 10 possibilities, is your bike pretty safe? <laughs> Obviously. I mean, you know, it's not just until the cows come home, he's going to run out of universes, okay? <laughs> so, so that's, what, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. What is the ratio of the number of functional ami amino acid sequences to, to all the possible combinations of a given length? Now, what Doug has done is he's, he's asked the question, how common or rare are functional sequences, i.e. proteins, among all the possible combinations of amino acids. And he's tested this for a very modest length sequence of about 150 amino acids. It's enough to make a protein fold. Most proteins are on average about 300 amino acids in length. And he's, he's found in his research, doing this method that was described in the film called uh, uh, Site-Directed Mutagenesis, that the ratio turns out to be a very, very scary number. And he's allowed me to, to kind of get to the punchline here. In other words, how many, how many folded protein, what protein folds are there for all the different combinations of amino acids? How many, for every one of those, how many are there of those? And, and based on his experimental research, which he's conducted over, over a dozen years, uh, he's established that it's about 1 over 10 to the 74th power. Okay. Now that's the, that was the result that was published in the paper that was mentioned in the Journal of Molecular Biology. There's a nice illustration in the film about what a number like one out of ten to the seventy-four is like, with the, you know, uh, one one atom in the galaxy or something like it. it, it it's, it's an immensely small ratio, and what that means is that as mutation selection are looking blindly for those functional proteins. And remember, natural selection selects for functional advantage. There's nothing there to select and preserve until it performs a function. So you've got to get the variations to find it first before there's any evolutionary progress whatsoever or, pro or, or for development. So now what I'd like Doug to do is come up and give us a little, this is, this is a paper he did in, that I'm describing he did in 2004. But he and his colleagues in the lab of Biologic at Redmond, Washington have been doing further analysis on this problem of combinatorial and have more to share about how prohibitive a difficulty it actually is for the mutation selection mechanism. It's non-technical as much as I can because you guys have been listening to a lot and I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to talk about, I'll touch on the problem that, that Steve mentioned, but I'm also going to talk about an even simpler version of the problem that we've been looking at. And I'm going to try to uh, talk about it without um, getting too technical by using some analogies. How do you make this go forward? Well, right. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I'm the director of Biologic Institute. You can go to this website to see more about who we are and what we do. And one of the things that we focus on in particular is this information problem. Now, my interest in particular is information at the level of single genes or small sets of genes that produce functional proteins. So I'm a protein guy and do experiments with proteins. And you saw in the movie, I think, uh, does this have laser? No, it doesn't. So I have to two things. Get complicated. Uh, a summary of how this works. This uh, gene sequences with the four bases of DNA encode the information that cells use to make proteins. And it goes through a number of steps. 
but it ends up being uh, the gene sequences give the information for the cell to make protein sequences, and these are chains made up of the 20 amino acids. And if those sequences are just right, it's a very rare property, but if they're just right, then these chains collapse spontaneously into compact three-dimensional structures that are stable. And if those structures have just the right shape, they can perform useful functions. In fact, they do all the functions, virtually all the functions in the cell at, at the molecular level. So that is the importance of information for proteins. These sequences need to have the right properties in order to get biological function, and they function by means of structure. Just to give you an idea of the kinds of variety of structure you get in proteins, there are thousands of fundamentally different protein structures that have been cataloged, and that number keeps going up every year. And this just gives you an idea of how wildly different they can be. Uh, and uh, what I want to do is use an analogy to um, examine what is being claimed by the Darwinists and to um, raise, hopefully, your skepticism of that claim. And the analogy is that um, the Darwinian mechanism is acting something like a search engine. And I'm using that because you're familiar, you're probably more familiar with search engines than you are with Darwinism. And this is what I mean. If, a, if an organism finds itself in need of a new function, a function that it does not have because it doesn't have the right gene, then supposedly, if Darwinism is true, it can appeal to this Darwinian process, this mechanism that goes out and does its thing, and lo and behold, eventually it will return, it will give that organism a new gene that, by producing a protein of the right structure, gives it the function that it needs. That's how Darwinism is supposed to work. So it's acting really kind of like a search engine in that when you type something in Google, you don't care how it works, it goes out to the world, finds what you need, brings it back. And these cells, they don't care how it works, they just care that it does work. Okay, so I want to look at two scales of problems that are solved by this Darwinian search mechanism, supposedly, if you believe that it works. And one is the very simplest level. This is what I'll call the beginner search. This is Darwinism, you know, uh, 101. Um, suppose you are a bacterial cell. You have the gene to make this beautiful purple protein that does this uh, purple function. But you need, you find yourself in need of a new function. And we'll call it the blue function. And it needs a slightly different structure in order to perform this function. Although, you see, these are actual protein structures, you see that they are very similar, they are slightly different, and it turns out that the slight differences are crucial. This one performs a function that this one does not, and vice versa. Well, so this is an example where um, if Darwinism can, can solve this problem, all the bacterial uh, species have to do is wait for the results of the search to come back, and Darwinism will, will give it the gene for a variant of this gene that has the right structural changes. So that's the beginner search, but there's a much more advanced level of search that I'm also interested in. This is what the 2004 paper was looking at. And that is, suppose the bacterial cell is in need of the green function, and suppose the green function cannot be performed by anything that looks at all like this, or like any of the other proteins that it already has. Then, the task that it's giving to, to the Darwinian search is go out and find me a whole new protein structure altogether. Do whatever you need to do, cobble together genes, mutate them. I need something radically different here. I need the green function and you're going to have to go get me a new structure. That is intuitively a much more difficult problem because you don't have something like this to begin with. You have to really uh, invent from scratch. But if you're a Darwinist, you believe and it works. So, whoops, I went forward two slides. So, let's imagine that, that uh, you're a, a convinced Darwinist and you go, you're convinced of this idea that it's a, a phenomenal search engine and you step into the headquarters of Google and you get the, the big shop there together and you say, I've got an idea that is going to put you out of business unless you pay me lots of money. And it's an idea for what I'm going to call Google on steroids. And they say, we'll give you a few minutes to tell us what you got. 
that you say, well, this is how